Hello. Yeah. Hey, welcome to History Chats this afternoon. Just checking. Okay, great. Um, yeah, welcome to History Chats this afternoon. Um, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes here. Um, and we're going to be talking about the um, interesting story of Fenwood, a village here in Marathon County. Um, yeah, not one that we, we typically... Um, it, it's, it's probably the smallest village, I, I think, by population, for sure. And, uh, and uh, yeah, kind of a little off the beaten path, but an interesting history. So we'll look forward to that coming up. I'm just going to make sure that everything is working. And, yeah, looks like everything is doing all right. Just bring up the stream in case anybody has any questions or anything, if you want to comments, what have you. Um, I will be monitoring, probably not live, but um, I'll try to answer those questions as we go, or at the end at least. Um, yeah. Cool. Looks like everything is working all right. Great. Um, while we're holding off here, I'm just going to leave some time here for people to join um, in case they, you know, want to join and didn't catch it right away. Um, of course, if you're watching after the fact, by this point, you probably skipped ahead a couple minutes, which is great. Um, but yeah, um, let me tell you about what's coming up um, in the future. Because um, So this is our History Chat series, where we, we take sort of a weekly, quick little story here, um, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, coming up later this month, on August 27th, on the Saturday, we're going to have our History Speaks series, which is our um, larger um, lecture series that we do. Um, and Michael Gock uh, was, a, was a great artist, or um, sorry, well, he's, I don't know, maybe he's an artist as well, but he's an author um, who wrote about um, the story of Badger, the Badger Army Ammunition Plant, which is a, is a really fascinating story and um, kind of an interesting, again, not something that you would necessarily know about Wisconsin, um, that we had this uh, thriving ammunition plant here, but um, it's a cool story. And uh, he'll be here talking about that live um, on Saturday at 2 p.m. on August 27th. Um, and we, we do try to live stream them too, if you can't make it in person. Um, sometimes the internet doesn't cooperate, so I try to make sure that at least it'll be recorded and uh, put up later. But of course, if you can join us live and you know uh, talk to Michael in person um, and, and be part of that, that's always great too. Um, yeah, I think... I think we'll, that's what I had ready to go here. Cool. So I think I'm just going to jump in. Um, let's see here. Let's put the slides up. Hey. So today we're talking about the village of Fenwood. I'll take those off. So like I said, um, this month we are, if you've been paying attention, we're doing some of the villages uh, in Marathon County. Um, here's our month-long graphics. So we're doing Hatley, um, Elderon, Spencer, and Fenwood today. Um, you know, and the idea is these are communities, and particularly we chose some of the smaller villages um, that, that might not have, you know, how often do we talk about Fenwood? It's, it's not, com it's not a, a common uh, story that we get into. So, um, you know, it's a good opportunity for, you know, to get to a little corner of the of the county that we don't normally get to. Um, and to be honest, Fenwood is a place that I knew as a location on a map. Um, I, I think I drove past it maybe or through it once, uh, but that was it was not it was not particularly something that I've looked into in depth. And so I thought this would be a great opportunity to, to for, for at least for me um, to, to dig into Fenwood and learn about the history of the village. There is a very interesting history in a lot of ways. The story of Fenwood, like a lot of the stories in, in uh, this part of the country, in the United States, and, and specifically in, in Marathon County, um, has a lot to do with the connection of the railroads. So I'm going to talk about that for a bit. So a very quick overview of the railroad story is that in the 1860s, we were really excited to get a railroad up here. Right. Um, and, and, and ultimately, you can see this is from 1882. We do get some of these lines. Right. The first one that comes in in the early 1870s was the Wisconsin Central Line, which was this yellow line that goes up the western edge. 
Now, originally, it was supposed to come to Wassa from Stevens Point and you know, go up the river. Uh, ultimately, it didn't end up panning out that way um, due to some financial issues. Uh, we had a contract the county did with them, and then they decided to go a different direction when you know, we were unable to raise the funds. And the funding is important here because um, the story of Fenwood kind of gets in here with the arrival a couple a year or two later in 1874 of the Wisconsin Valley Line, which is in red here. The Wisconsin Valley Line um, is another community that uh, a railroad that <clears throat> Marathon County enters into a contract with, and that the county will raise some money to pay them to come here, um, and, and that often came with raising bonds and stuff like that. Uh, but Marathon County doesn't have a whole lot of cash flow, let's say. Uh, or reserves. And so um, in addition to giving them land uh, for the right of way, like literally where the, the railroad gets built, um, we also give a bunch of land as part of that payment. But the idea that, for example, the future site of Fenwood is part of that deal, like nobody's living there in the 1880s, right? Because there's no major river that goes through that area. It's not a thoroughfare. There's no road going through the area. You know, maybe there's some farmers that are kind of moving around there. You get wean which I think is probably just the Helkowitz's farm, to be honest. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot more out here, but you know, there are a couple people that are, are homesteading out there, but that's about it. But there's potential for the future. There's great harvest, uh, or, uh, um, sorry, timberlands out here, particularly a lot of hardwoods that could have the potential to, to be worth something. So they get the money um, you know, in that land. So the Wisconsin Central, or sorry, the Wisconsin Valley Line owns this um, up until 1891. And at this point, there is some speculation that they want to continue to add more rail lines. But we'll get to that in a second, because the guy who ends up buying out that land and kind of jumpstarts this, really important to the, the history of the village of Fenwood, is a guy named Cornelius S. Curtis. And Curtis is probably best known by, by many people uh, these days, if, if you do know the name, uh, because of the factory uh, he came up here from um, Clinton, Iowa, where his, his brothers had started a pretty uh, successful lumber company. Um, and he builds a sash and door company, you know, to make window sashes and doors on the west bank of the Wisconsin River here in Wausau. So this was that complex Curtis and Yale. Later, they bring in um, Samuel Yale um, as a partner. And so he gets his name on the, 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 the company too. Uh, but this is sort of a branch and this starts in 1881. And after about a decade, I mean, I'm not going to get too deep into, we'll have to come back and talk about Curtis at some point because he's a really interesting figure. Get back his name. Um, he, in his early years, had, had you know, he had a little uh, mercantile store. He had a little operation here. Like, he wasn't just, I'm going to make windows and doors. I'm going to do a bunch of different stuff. So it's not a surprise that once he gets here, he sees the opportunity to get into the Fenwood area because the following year, or around 1880, um, another line had come to Wassa, which is the, the blue line. This is the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western. And honestly, the names of these are not super important for the, the purposes of, of Fenwood, but this is important because after coming here in 1880, and there's also this line that goes up, which I should be the Wisconsin Valley. It should be red. But if we actually look at the way that they drew this, it makes it very... It implies that this is, is the blue line. So I made it purple just to hedge my bets, but I'm pretty sure it's the red line there. Um, it's the Wisconsin Valley. Anyway, um, in the 18, end of the 1880s, um, there is a guy here named Alfred Carey, um, kind of secretary for the, the, the Milwaukee uh, Lakeshore and Western Railway Company here. And he pioneers this idea that we really ought to continue this line. And so he is going to push this idea of moving, uh, connecting Wassa going westward um, to Marshfield down here, which is another community that had emerged because of the railroads. And so this line ends up getting built in the 1890s. Again, as part of that uh, you know, agreement, they, they gave a bunch of land the right away. Um, and and uh, Curtis gives the secretary here, uh, Mr. Carey, um, the land here. And he is going to be the one that is going to incorporate, or at least not incorporate, uh, lay out the village, the future village of Fenwood. Um, but there's other communities here, too. Um, Stratford is kind of a big one. It's down here. Uh, Edgar also gets um, uh, platted out around this time by the same guy, Alfred Carey, um, as far as I'm aware. I didn't look too deeply into that, but I saw that as a thing. And then, of course, Marathon City gets connected. And these are important for the thriving communities that are going to merge in the 1890s into the new century. 
But here, you know, this is this is a little bit later, but this is basically the same plat that um, was established um, by um, Carey back in 1891. So a decade later, you can see there are some buildings in here because this is the, the plat map from the, the, the county plat book um, in 1901. But it, it shows that there is, you know, they got the railroad going through. Um, and notably, there's the Fenwood Lumber Company because this is where Curtis is involved, right? Or, yeah, um, Cornelius Curtis has sold basically the land that will become the village of um, Fenwood. But he also um, owns a bunch of the rest of the land around it. And now that the railroad comes here, we can really get into logging. It, the reason that they hadn't really been logging before is because there's not really a great river that you can just float the logs down, which is the way you had to do it in the 60s and 70s. But now that we're in the 1880s, uh, and or actually into the 90s, um, that railroad jet allows for you to harvest the trees. And so you could, you could put a little jet out, you could cut down a bunch of trees, put them on a train car, bring them to an existing sawmill, like the ones at Wassa or Mosini, um, or in this case, you can build a little, you know, there, there's such uh, an abundance of, of lumber here um, that, hey, why not just make a little sawmill in Fenwood, which is what happens, right? So the Fenwood Lumber Company operates from um, 1891, um, and this is the main reason that people are here uh, for a long time. Um, it, it ends up getting, by 1911, they had, it, one of the problems with the railroads uh, logging is that you tend to burn through the lumber pretty quickly. You cut down a lot of trees, you clear cut acres after acres. So by 1911, um, yeah, the lumber industry was not super thriving here in Fenwood. Although it will be noticed that this particular picture is actually from the R. Connor Company of Stratford. Um, who, after um, Curtis pulls out the, the Fenwood Lumber Company, they, um, the Connor Company end up, ends up, you know, operating a little mill here for about two or three years, um, three, four years maybe. Um, so, so lumbering isn't completely gone, but by the 19-teens, we're moving away from the lumber industry. Even though that had been the thing, the Fenwood Lumber Company um, had really, they literally put the area on the map. So here's the extent here. You can see the, the frozen lake, Lake Fenwood, um, and uh, the sawmill. And then you can see from um, the village itself, you can see it in the distance, um, which brings us to the village itself. So at its height during the mid-1890s, uh, I'm, I'm told, and I'm here, I should, I should take a moment to mention, um, I think this is this... Um, the Fenwood 100 Years, the Centennial book that they put out in 1991, was a lot of help for this. I, I grabbed a lot of information and pictures and stuff from the book. Um, so they quote some articles from the, the 30s that say that, like, hey, um, uh, Fenwood was at its height. They, they estimated seven to 800 people in 1895, give or take a year or two, which is a lot of people. And... Part of me wonders whether that's an exaggeration. Um, the town of Wien in this, in this, in, because this is in the town of Wien, right? Um, the village is, is part of that. It's not incorporated yet. It won't incorporate until 1904. So technically it's part of the town of Wien until 1904. Um, and the town of Wien at the turn of the century has like 800, 900 people in it total. So the idea that 700 of them are here, eh. But lumber men tend to, you know, they're seasonal. They may not have been there when they took the census. Uh, hard to know. But what is clear is that high point in 1895 or so is going to see a steady decline. As the lumber industry kind of moves away from the area and we start to move into other things, <coughs> Fenwood is going to need a new existence. It's going to need something to, to continue onwards. So what is that thing? Well, one of the things that's really interesting and again, the, the Fenwood um, Centennial book uh, has a very similar graphic to this. Um, it's, it's slightly different from a different, different year, but basically the same thing. And they point out that this bit here in red, they were overly ambitious when they platted the land. This bit never really gets settled. Um, these blocks aren't blocks. Many of these streets that you see here uh, never actually exist. Um, certainly the ones on the eastern um, edge there. Um, but instead, this is kind of the area that Fenwood ends up settling in. Um, I was going to... Hold on. Uh, yeah, so... But here's, here's what it does look like, right? Um, in 1904, they incorporate. Um, 
this is a, a picture of one of the street scenes. Um, that is the village hall in the jail. The jail is an interesting thing. Um, they almost immediately, uh, one of the very first things they do as a village is they establish the funding for a jail, which is not something you typically see in a village like this. Um, but maybe during this era, again, there's a lot of rough lumbermen kind of coming and going. Maybe they wanted a little security. Um, they were kind of far out of the way from, you know, the major existing communities. So maybe it made sense from that perspective too. Um, it was also not a huge jail. It was like a cell where they had like some cots, maybe like one or two. Um, but anyway, kind of an interesting little thing. But that's the village hall. Um, across the way, you can see the church. Um, this is the one on the left here. Uh, so there was two churches. Around 1910, you see the establishment of two Lutheran churches. And there might be some more nuance. I'm sure that there's some synod separation kind of things going on. Um, what I will say is St. Paul's Lutheran Church, established in 1910, that's this building. Um, I, I can't tell when they go away, but um, they were also a, a branch of, I believe, St. John um, Evangelical Lutheran Church in the town of Wien. Um, so they were kind of associated, and maybe it just made sense for, you know, by the 1940s, 50s, maybe people were just going out to St. John's instead of, you know, maintaining a separate building. And there might be something similar here with St. Peter's, also in, in existence around 1910, although um, from what I understand in the early years, um, in, in maybe even until the 1980s, um, they used other buildings like the town hall or the school buildings after that stopped being a thing, uh, but they built their own building. Again, I can't tell whether or not, this is gonna be a theme here, by the way, for Fenwood. Um, as somebody who, you know, hasn't lived there, has, isn't as familiar with that area, um, I believe the, the churches are no longer, you know, in operation here. Um, maybe they just have absolutely no web presence or, you know, recognition in like directories and things, but um, I believe that um, sometime in the early 2000s, I believe, maybe, maybe the, the 20 teens, um, St. Peter's also ceases uh, having services there, um, maybe in congregation with uh, a church in Stratford or Edgar. Although if I'm wrong with that, you know, feel free to, to write in the comments because I, I, I would be very interested to know. Um, similarly, again, another theme that you tend to see is Fenwood is a community that has a lot of stuff, right? They've got banks, they've got churches and schools. Often they are associated with other communities, as is the case here in the Fenwood State Bank. Um, this was a branch of the Edgar State Bank that they opened, you know, down in Fenwood to, to conduct business. Um, starts in 1916, I want to say, and then I think it, it, again, contradicting information about when it goes away. You don't really see a whole lot happening, but I've also saw somebody that said that they had just retired from the Fenwood State Bank in 1950, so in an, in an article from like 52. So, um, yeah, uh, but it exists, right? That's cool. Uh, probably the most exciting thing that happened here is it was robbed in 1931, pretty high profile uh, situation. Um, apparently a guy came in and stole a bunch of money from the tiller and then got the clerk to open the safe. He took like, I think it was like 20, uh, two and a half or $3,000, somewhere in that, in that era. Um, and, and that's like 1931 money. So I'm sure it was quite a bit of money he stole. Um, and then he goes back and, you know, his, his getaway driver and they run away and then they get basically caught immediately. Um, and it was notable, apparently at the time they were, they were lauded for, um, from the moment that the, the, the robbery took place to the time that they caught, uh, charged, sentenced, um, you know, all of that. And then it was like less than a week from the time that he, uh, the, the people were responsible for the robbery. I think it was like even like 48 hours or something until they were like on their way to jail. Um, to serve time. Um, I don't know, 1931, interesting times, um, and an interesting little little vignette here uh, in Fenwood. Similarly, the, the ba Badger Basket, yeah, let's try that again, the Badger Basket Factory, which was a, sort of a branch factory that they, the Edgar-based uh, company had, I, I believe Edgar-based, um, they had a little factory here. Um, there's a bunch of these little things, like there's a pickle factory that was going for a while. Um, I think they struggled to get enough cucumbers from the farmers in the area. They were trying to get people to grow cucumbers so that they could, could do that. Um, yeah, pickle factory, basket factory, some, some interesting little cottage industries here. Public schools are another interesting thing. Kind of similar parallel story here. Um, you know, 
county schools, you got you got to have the one room schoolhouse. In this case, I believe this is a graded school, um, so it's not just one, you know, room for one teacher for all the students. You can see there's a couple stu um, teachers here. Um, in the 18, I think 94, they started to have classes, a school here, and um, yeah, they continue. Um, one of the the larger whole as a as a village, um, they probably could have made a, a better case for keeping their own. Uh, funded school system, you know, as opposed to like the, the rural areas, um, you know, if you're in a township, um, by the 1950s, there's a lot of push to try to consolidate those those schools so you don't have, you know, two, three hundred, um, you know, one room schoolhouses in the county. Uh, but ultimately, the same thing happens by the end of, by 1962, I believe, uh, the Fenwood Public Schools are consolidated um, and, and thereafter, the, the, I, I'm not sure exactly if they go to the Edgar Public School District or the Stratford, or if the dividing line is kind of right there. Um, but that's what happens after that. And then, as I said, the, the school buildings get repurposed, as, as is the case for many of these things. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that are happening. By the 1950s, the old Fenwood, the sort of second, the village era, right? You had the lumbering era, then you had the village era. Now you have in the 1950s another set of changes uh, that's happening. Um, the depot, right? They had a depot that was put here. The Chicago and Northwestern is the, the company that ends up running um, by the 20th century, I believe, um, the lines here. In the 1950s, they decide, you know, we're not going to actually do passenger service here. Again, cars become more common. The roads get built up. Um, maybe Fenwood is, is a population of, you know, less than 200 people. Maybe it isn't worth uh, doing passenger service. In, in general, um, the, the, the railroads stopped doing passenger service in the 50s and 60s to a lot of places. Uh, they continued to, to operate uh, freight through here until, oops, until 1981, they finally, um, the railroad stops functioning. And, and ever since, there has not been a, a railroad passing through Fenwood. Um, yeah. One interesting thing is the Fenwood bowling alleys. Um, which I believe gets started in the late 30s. And this is one of the, the few, um, I, it, it feels like, as somebody who's maybe not as familiar, I don't think every little village uh, in Wisconsin had a bowling alley. Um, and I think this is one of the things that gave a unique flavor to Fenwood. You know, people from the region um, would go here for, you know, for parties, for 4-H club meetings, for, you know, let's, let's go out and play, let's bowl. Um, and, and apparently it was is around through the, I don't think it's still in operation, again, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, people are more familiar with Fenwood. Uh, but from everything that I've looked into, I, I don't seem to see that it is still a thing. Um, but I think through the 70s, maybe even the 80s, there was a, a bowling alley there, um, which is kind of interesting. But of course, the story of, of Fenwood, as with a lot of communities out of lumbering and the railroad, um, becomes farming. And so as you can see, um, and I'm going to bring up, here's Google. You, uh, this is this is Fenwood uh, via uh, Earth Google Earth. You can see that. Um, you know, there's farms right in here, um, and the farms are you know that's a big part of the community. Um, this actually goes back to uh, uh, Curtis again. Uh, Cornelius Curtis may by 1910 have decided that the hardwoods had been harvested and that. You know, we didn't necessarily need to lumber here, uh, but then he starts to get into a stock farm, uh, which is was kind of common during those days for for sort of a hobby farm almost. Um, and and one of the things that he does is he introduces as as I don't know if you can see the label. This is maybe a little clear. You know, breeders of purebred Holstein cattle, um, and Jersey um, Duroc hogs. I mean, the pigs, the hogs aren't. As, as popular, but obviously, you know, if you're, if you're from the area, if you know anything about Marathon County, we become um, and are a, a pretty big dairy community. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the Curtis um, efforts here, the, the stock farm uh, company, I think by like 1930, 31, uh, auctions off its, its assets. Uh, Curtis himself dies in 1916. Um, so, uh, but by that point, other people had taken it up, and of course, dairy farming and, and other farms uh, have become really important. Um, and, and often villages like Fenwood, outside of their initial existence for, you know, lumbering, um, they become kind of the community hub for the area's dairy farms. Fenwood, not so, I mean, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. I mean, they had a cheese factory, like everybody had a cheese factory at that point in time. And the, the, I think in the late 20s, it was a cooperative effort by some of the farmers. Um, by the 40s, a uh, new, new, 
uh, family buys the facility um, and they decide, eh, we're not going to make cheese anymore. So it kind of falls by the wayside. And, and as far as I know, there hasn't been a big, like, uh, focus on on the cheese side of things or, or the dairy side of things in Fenwood proper. Um, although, you know, there are, uh, what you do see in Fenwood is uh, implement stores and, you know, stock, you know, in, in farm, you know, supplies and things like that. Uh, the big one um, that comes out of this, I, I probably would arguably the Fisher uh, family who, I think in the, they start in like 1940. Um, and they, you know, keep expanding in the 60s and into the 70s in particular. Um, but yeah, Fisher Truck and Bus, um, they are, let's see, did I, I think this works better on Google Maps. Let me just pull up the thing. So again, this is a slightly different thing, but Google Maps, you can see here's, here's Fenwood. And when we zoom in, um, you know, Fisher Transportation, Fisher Truck, if we go to the, the map here, you know, this is this becomes kind of a big part of the overall community here. Um, and, and like I said, they are, um, you know, they deal in sort of implements the, the, uh, the mechanization of farms, you know, you need, you need supplies, you need um, uh, mechanical expertise. Um, they're selling, you know, uh, transportation and, and buses, again, with, you know, the consolidation of the public school system, um, that comes on the back of, you know, the yellow school buses and, and, and Fisher, um, is going to be one of the, the main suppliers in this region. So kind of cool. And, and there are other things too. I, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, the bowling alley disappeared and the schools disappeared and the churches are no longer here. You know, there are other institutions, um, Frankie's, you know, bar and tavern here. Um, again, I think this is from the late 80s, early 90s, um, but if we go to, back to Google Maps, uh, or actually, no, let me, let me go to the set. I don't think it has the same thing. So it, now it's Illusions Grill, and if I, um, we do a street view here, you can see kind of clearly that this is. <coughs> so there's the Frankie's Bar, and... Um, you know, the building's still being used as, as I, I'm not sure, I think in the early 2000s they changed the name, um, but still kind of, you know, one of the local landmarks. There's probably other other examples of this too, but just to show that it's it's still kind of a community. It's it's interesting though, because as, as a community, as a village, I mean, Fenwood has never really been super populous. Um, this is a, a graph, you know, real quick of the population of Fenwood. Uh, in order to become a village in Wisconsin, if you're in the rural areas, you need to have a minimum 150 people living in your village. And, you know, it's not like if you fall underneath that, suddenly you're no longer a village. But you can see that we're kind of hovering right around 150 for most of the century, um, which is really interesting because this is a community that... Let's see, how do I put this? Uh, you know, there, what, what, what is the identity, you know, in the 1950s and 60s for Fenwood? Um, you know, it's, it's changing. Um, and yet people, you know, are attached to it. The, the families stick around, you know, people are moving there. Um, and there is this sort of continuation. In, in some ways, Fenwood really, I wouldn't be surprised if in 15, 20 years, the, Fenwood is no longer a village. I also would not be surprised if in, you know, 15, 20 years, it still is a village. Um, it's just one of those communities that is, has kept its identity, even though, you know, arguably Edgar and Stratford nearby have larger populations and, and, you know, have become sort of magnets for some of the services and community events. And yet, you know, here's Fenwood still here in 2022. Um, yeah. I'm sure I'm, I, again, I apologize if I, if I skimmed over important stuff, but um, it's kind of interesting. Again, as somebody who, who's not really spent much time in Fenwood, um, it was kind of an interesting process of learning about it and trying to put this together. And, and uh, yeah, so there you go. Um, I'm going to check just to see if there's any questions. Cool, some comments here. I appreciate the, the feedback and, you know, tagging people who might be interested in, in learning or, or seeing the program. Um, yeah. I will just say um, also that um, so next week uh, we're going to continue our our theme here for the villages of Marathon County. Um, 
initially, when we when we publicized this on, on social media, we had the dates flip for the first and third month. So we were going to do Elderon, and then I found out that I had, you know, made a mistake on that. So uh, we did Hatley last week, but we're going to be doing Elderon next week. So if you're waiting and excited for Elderon, um, there we go. There it is. Another kind of small little community that has, has an interesting story attached to a different origin and... Um, I know Gary Gisselman has been working on putting a, together a program for that. So um, hope to see you back next time for that. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. And I, I guess I'll, I'll call it there. Have a, have a wonderful uh, week and we'll hopefully see you.